You did it. <laughs> I did it. Okay, and we've got volume on somewhere. Mine. Oh, hold on. Yep, check your phone. Okay, I turned my volume off. Perfect. Now we're good. Sometimes yeah, my it's... phone just turns it up anyways, but Exactly. I I had mine turned down and then as soon as you connect it puts it back up. Um, you know, technology. Listen. Yes. It does well, it listens too much actually. So... <laughs> I'm definitely not a technology uh wizard. Uh plants are more my thing. Uh, yeah, you're much better with plants. Well, let me tell you, yesterday we had so many technical difficulties, we actually had to switch platforms. So um, technical difficulties is my middle name. I'll just repeat that. Uh, so everybody, welcome Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. We are continuing our Gut Health Week. Um, and so we've tried to bring you some of our friends who are incredible top experts in their fields. So today we have Rita Hogan, who is canine herbalist. And um, Rita is from Seattle. Olympia, Washington. Olympia, Olympia. So it shows you what I to see. Geography 101, fifth grade. Anyway. 45 miles, Judy, 45 miles. That's it. It's 45 <laughs> miles from Seattle. So it's the same. It's the same. Anyway, that neck of the woods on the other side of the country. So, but she is sort of the herb person extraordinaire. Um, if you've never had a chance to hear Rita speak, I would strongly recommend it. Um, she does have a book coming out. It's a little behind where she would like it to be in production, <laughs> but sometime in the next eh, six months or so, we will be promoting uh, probably one of the top herbal books. So we're really excited. I'm excited for that. So I'm excited for it too. <laughs> so, um, so thank you, Rita, for agreeing to come on. We really appreciate it. And, uh, we'll be happy to put links to all of your, um, your website and all that kind of stuff in the, the, um, the show notes. So today we want to talk about gut health and I really appreciate you coming on. Um, so your practice is, is yours, um, a, like, online consultation, phone consultation? Do you see animals um, in person? I, I see some animals locally, but very little. Um, okay. uh, I have a just a full-time online practice. I, I meet with people all over the world. It's amazing. So, yeah. It's amazing. And it's so important because there are people who are in what I call veterinary deserts where they just do not have access. Some of them, they have to drive a hundred miles to get a traditional veterinarian, but for many, many people, it is almost impossible to find a holistic veterinarian or someone who is willing to use things like food or herbs instead of using traditional medications that we all know have tons of side effects that may cause more trouble. Yes, very much so. <laughs> very much yes. so. Yes, yes. So, all right. So what are the the gut-related issues that you end up having consultations with most often? I mean, there, there's a long list. I mean, talk about a few of them. But uh, what, do you, what are you mostly getting people coming to you and saying, I'm having a problem with that? Well, um, one of the uh, fortunate and unfortunate things that happens to me is that I see people when they are at the end. You know, they're just like, I've tried everything. Yep. I've seen all these vets. I don't know what to do. And they're frustrated. So yep. I'm definitely part counselor. And yeah. then, <laughs> and then um, you know, I, I deal with herbs. And some of the, I think, like the most that I, I mean, the most things that I see are obviously you know, brush border related, uh, situate like conditions that, uh, in my belief are all pretty much all connected like yeast overgrowth, um, SIBO, uh, leaky gut, um, chronic constipation, chronic diarrhea, chronic vomiting, acid reflux. And those are all related to uh, food sensitivities, histamine intolerance, you know, mast cell, mast cell tumor, which in my humble opinion, is very gut related. And so, um, you know, it's very gut driven. And mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, mast cell tumor, um, things like that, um, itching, scratching, which, you know, and everything gut related is liver related is, is lymph related. <laughs> Everything's connected. So, and I think that, you know, um, you've been driving that home for a long time and it, and people need to realize that, yeah, in, when you go see a regular doctor, you're going to go see a, uh, an endocrinologist for your endocrine system. You're going to go see a liver specialist and a kidney, but we, they should all be in a boardroom together. 
you know, so that they're, <laughs> you know, they should all be in the boardroom together. So I kind of help educate people about how dogs are individuals. We need to think of the body as an ecosystem and it's everything's connected. It's not just a gut issue. It's a liver issue. It's a kidney issue. It's a lymph issue. It's a heart issue. Most things are related to cardiac <laughs> function. And so, um, yeah, so I see a lot, but yeast overgrowth, food sensitivities, uh, leaky gut, um, microbiome dysfunction. Yeah. And again, they're all and, the same. And, you know, I'm glad that you brought that up, that all these things are interrelated. Um, and we do talk about that a lot. But this is where traditional medicine literally is a failure because you go in with an animal that's got itchy skin, maybe it's got some skin infections. And what do you get? You get treatment for the skin. You get shampoos. You get antihistamines. You might get steroids. But that's really being driven from the immune systems out of whack. Well, where is 80% of the immune system? Oh, yeah, that's in the gut. And so for, for years, we, we've had all these poor animals and, and humans that get treated for the symptoms, but the underlying cause is never looked at. And that underlying cause, like you said, is going to be in the gut and the gut can't function without the liver. Cause, oh, by the way, the liver filters all the blood flow from the gut and detoxes or tries to pull out everything that's there. So if we get so focused on one specific symptom or one specific issue, we're ignoring all the other contributors. Yes, absolutely. I, that, that felt like a church choir to me, you know, it's like, <laughs> ah, um, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Judy, that, that is just so relevant and, and it just takes education and a little trust. And of course, a lot of patience. Because um, another thing, you know, it's kind of like, I call it antibiotic syndrome, where, uh, for people, um, antibiotic syndrome is kind of where you give your dog antibiotics for one reason or another, usually not warranted. And <laughs> yeah. um, then you, a month later, you kind of forgot that they, you gave them antibiotics. And you're wondering, what is happening? And why, why is my dog all of a sudden getting up in the middle of the night and scratching? Why are they have leakage in their eyes you know why are they getting a uti um i don't understand my dog was healthy and i you know i gave him some probiotics that's not going to cut it you know <laughs> and 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 it takes a lot of work to to repair the damage that one seven day round of antibiotics and a lot of dogs are on antibiotics for 14 21 days i met a dog six a, to eight a weeks months ago i uh, been on antibiotics for a year for skin problems and, you know, and it's like, oh, my God. So, you know, and it it's nothing to do with the person's intention. It's just I think it's mis, misguidance and um, yeah. just kind of that whole germ theory where you just got to kill it. Yeah. You know, we got to kill everything and we're killing ourselves by trying to kill everything. So, um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, I, you know, I've got my work cut out for me, but I love it. Just like, I can, you know anyone who watches you can see your passion in trying to help <laughs> animals. You know, we all have this passion and mine just happens to be in little plants just everywhere, <laughs> you know? Um, and the miracles that I see happen with plants, you know, just miracles. And, um, and the good thing is, is I think science is catching up, you know, they're, they're really doing their deal. They're actually studying plants now. There, um, is a, though, there is a lot of research going on with plants. Yeah. The problem is the pharmaceutical industry is having a hard time figuring out how to uh, make money off of that. So, yes. you know, it, it, we tend to get a lot more research when they find a compound. I forget what I was researching the other day, and there was some um, compound found in a, a bush in Australia that it, and I don't remember what I was reading. It was something for the new book. I was researching something and it was like, Okay, they found this compound in this plant in Australia. They'll probably destroy the ecosystem now by Absolutely. harvesting all of that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, sometimes they find that, but then they want to make it as a synthetic, which is not the same as what we find in the actual plant. Absolutely. Even standardized herbs aren't the same, like curcumin versus turmeric. You know, curcumin can cause anemia, where there has never been a documented case of, cur of turmeric causing anemia. Um, it's because all of those little plant constituents that can be hundreds and even thousands all help regulate all the other. I have to break the news to everyone. 
nature is more intelligent than we will ever be. <laughs> and, and so it has, I mean, it is, it's just awe inspiring and, and it, it, full of mathematics and, and rhythm and consistency, you know? And so um, it has all these constituents that, that keep that little plant in check that keep turmeric from causing anemia. But once that science is very so focused on what in this plant, let's, let's is take the out that one compound active yep. ingredient, you know, yep. And yeah. I get it from a science, I mean, I have a very scientific mind as well. I've got three microscopes on the right hand side here, but like, <laughs> I, I love science, but if we just focus on science and wormhole it, like pin, you know, just yeah. right there, we're going to miss so much that yep. nature has to offer. So I, you know, like I mentioned in my new book, you know, I think integrative care is really where we need to be mm -hmm. because there's so much as a veterinarian that you can offer and um, so much, uh, many, almost all veterinarians can offer so much, but there's also so much that people in traditional practices in the field, working with plants, working with people, and what science would call anecdotal uh, medicine, um, can offer so much. Yeah. You know, when the same thing has worked 200 times in my practice, I don't need science to validate it. Do you know <laughs> exactly. what I mean? <laughs> I mean, well, it works every time. So, you know, I mean... Uh, it's it's one of those things, but we can just really learn from each other. Yeah, it's it's that's kind of the same thing that I talk about with food so much, where I don't like to see recipes with a whole bunch of synthetic vitamins thrown, vitamins and minerals thrown in there. It's like I want my vitamins and minerals coming from whole food sources, that whole plant source, that whole uh, protein or meat source. Because the body knows what to do with that. And the body will use what it needs, to spit out the excess. But when you give it as a synthetic, it's it's almost like jamming it in that hole and saying, here, you have to use this. And then the body goes, I don't know what to do. Um, you know, like copper toxicity. We, there, it's a huge problem because of all the synthetics. We don't see that when we're feeding whole foods. No. And then you get the, you know, and then you get really weird selenium sources. And... <laughs> That it can't do anything with that copper. So it's just, it's a mess. And so, yeah. And another thing, and this is a gut, uh, listen, this is a gut thing. Um, folic acid. Okay. You're going to see folic acid in so many things. It's in much more human products, but you're going to see folic acid. And what's weird about folic acid is that in the body, it's called folic acid. But when you have it outside of the body in products, it's, it's synthetic folic acid and it's in so many things and it really messes with the receptors in the body because natural folate needs to bind to those receptors and folic acid is actually binding which the body can't do all that much it can't absorb the amount that it really needs to do and then so you mess with methylation which is another which is another conversation we're not going to get into that but methylation really the liver is so dependent on good methylation and how methylation dictates how you detox chemicals, how your dog detoxes chemicals. And when you ingest too much folic acid, you are messing with liver health. And so I would like to see, I would like to get folic acid out of supplements. Um, that's just my little rant on that gut health thing. I love it. I love the it. liver and the gut are so connected. So, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying throw your dog food out that has folic acid added to it, especially if it's like the last ingredient. I'm not saying that, but then go check your treats and your supplements. If you want to pick one thing, pick the food and that's it. Get rid of the rest because you need to be supplementing with folate or folinic acid. And, um, and that's a big deal uh, that not a lot of people are talking about. And science has proved that one. Not See, me. I told you she's brilliant. You've got to, you've got to hear this <laughs> and speak because I mean, you got a science or science brain. <laughs> oh, I do. I, 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 I do puzzles all the time and I love puzzles and the body's a puzzle. But let's it talk is. about the gut. Let's talk about Yeah, let's gut. talk about the gut. So, okay. um, so um, what, what is your, so we're, I want to talk about what are like some of your top herbs to go to. And well, then I want to talk about probiotics versus herbs or absolutely. using in conjunction I'm, or whatever. Absolutely. So, um, <laughs> To get to the herbs, I just want, like, it's a puzzle, right? So I want people to understand how interrelated all of these gut issues, chronic diarrhea, constipation, acid reflux, food sensitivities, which a lot of people are dealing with right now, um, stress, 
uh, histamine intolerance, SIBO, okay? These are all connected, and this is how. So if you look at yeast overgrowth in the body, which, as you know, is a big problem, um, what causes yeast? Stress and the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve goes through the gut, and it regulates the stress response, also the brain response to the microbiome and everything else that's going on in your dog's gut, including um, including the, the relation between the heart and the gut, right? So the vagus nerve and stress. And stress is a huge thing that people aren't paying attention to. People, It's getting more attention right now, but it's huge. Um, antibiotics. We could talk for days. Liver weakness, <laughs> antihistamines, acid reducers, antacids. Um, acid reducers are more like PPIs, protein pump inhibitors, that people them. love to put their dogs on. And um, antacids. That really messes with yeast overgrowth. And then the vagus nerve also regulates, let's not, regulates how the body controls yeast. So if a dog is stressed and you're stressed and your dog loves you and pays attention to you, um, you probably both have a little of yeast overgrowth. So there's those things, right? And then acid reducer and, and, and acids mess with stomach acid which stomach acid, the level of stomach acid indicates how well your dog avoids pathogens, how well your dog breaks down yeast, how much histamine your dog is giving off or how it processes histamine. It breaks down proteins. If proteins get into the small intestine that are not broken down and cannot be broken down, right, into their little tiny amino acid friends, you will get the immune system saying, hey, there's a foreign invader in here and it's getting into the bloodstream and I'm going to mark it for termination. Then your dog can't eat that substance for a very long time. Okay. Uh, sometimes even up to a year. Yeah. Uh, so antacids, they are not your friend. And you know what? Um, I see that in records all the time. It's like the first thing to go to here, we'll put them on famotidine. <sighs> and, and it just causes so many problems, but you don't, you're just like, well, he's not, it's not doesn't have acid reflux anymore. But the issue with acid reflux is it's not your dog actually has too little acid and it's in the wrong. Sometimes it's in the wrong place. Um, so that can mess with your brain. And then we have food sensitivities. OK, so we just dealt with yeast food sensitivities. What causes food sensitivities? Yeast overgrowth, uh, antibiotics, antihistamines, enzyme insufficiency. That means low stomach acid. Uh, over your body not breaking down histamine, um, stress, the vagus nerve, over vaccination, nutritional, nu nutritional deficiencies, and thyroid health. And thyroid health is affected by anything we're talking about today. So then we have IBD, IBS, and SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, what causes that? Antibiotics. <laughs> vaccines, uh, anti -acid, anti acids, uh, acid reducers, you know, antihistamines. These are and antibiotics and steroids. These it just it kind of is like when your when your dog takes that substance substance. It's really what is your dog predisposed to genetically most of the time, um, and that's what your dog's going to get. That's what that's what's going to be the focus on your dog. But it really is all one big problem, and yeah. so um, it's and then of course which I know, Dr. Judy, you could talk about for years, is flagyl, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> Metronidazole. <laughs> yes, metronidazole. <laughs> so when I say what your dog is genetically predisposed to, it doesn't mean have to be the genetics they were born with. It can be the genetics that are turning on epigenetically when we feed our dog and when we give them flea and tick meds, heartworm meds, uh, Flagyl turns on inflammation markers in the gut. It is scientifically proven. There's a really great pay, uh, little excerpt on, uh, in the Forever Dog that Rodney and Karen put in there on page 172. <laughs> and it is, it's my favorite page in the whole book because I was like, yes, I'm so glad they put this in there. Um, is what flagyl does to your gut and your genes. So there's that. And as you know, you the standard of care for flagyl and metrodize and all same medicine when you go in for diarrhea, it is the standard of care of allopathic medicine. You're going to go out with a prescription of flagyl. Uh-huh. 
right? Yep. And then you're, and then a few months later, your dog is going to have chronic diarrhea and or vomiting or constipation. And then they're going to start getting inflammation in the gut. They're going to get start getting food sensitivities, liver weakness, and then they're going to start itching and scratching like crazy. And then that's when we all go crazy, right? Well, yeah. So, yes. you know, it's, it's, then we have to go back and we have to do all this repair, which we're going to talk about. Um, but I think that something is so often overlooked and this is things, things always occur the way they're supposed to. So my consultation this morning was with someone who is a very high stress individual mm -hmm. and her dog is a very high stress individual. Mm -hmm. And so the dog has the chronic reoccurring vomiting issues. And so we went through, like I said, the diet is not what's causing the problem. Like she's tried 75 different diets and uh, dog does great for a few weeks and then always ends up back with the vomiting issue. But we haven't addressed the stress issue. And I said, well, first of all, yes, we have to address your dog's stress, but we also have to address your stress. And I think that people don't understand how closely correlated our pets' emotions are. And this is dogs and cats. Uh, cats just hide it better. Uh, but their emotions are so closely cor correlated with ours. If we are a high stress, high anxiety, like I'm a wood personality. My liver cheese stagnation is through the roof. I get very, yeah, you know, <laughs> and I just want to explode. And I, and I see it in my dogs and it's like all of a sudden everybody's running around. Nobody's behaving. They're all barking at each other. They're jumping on each other. I'm like, oh, let's check in. Where am I? Oh yeah. Where are they? Oh yeah. So yeah. let's, let's not, um, minimize the effects of our emotions on our pets. Like if you're in grief and you're weepy, that has an effect. And, you know, we all go through periods of grief in our lives. We, we have to, we, ha we have to work through it, but we need to learn how to check in with ourselves um, so that we can check in with them because so often it's pair. Well, it's always, paired. it is. And it's so essential for gut health because that vagus nerve. Yeah. And I love that. Yes, it dictates fight or flight or sympathetic, right? So sympathetic is that rest, relaxation, and it's digestion. You cannot digest food properly when you are in fight or flight. I tell people all the time, don't eat in the car because the car <laughs> is fight or flight, right? You're driving, it's, you're in a video game, you're driving, and you're, you're, it's defensive driving all the time. Um, don't eat in the car. Uh, don't feed your dog when you're stressed. Don't let your dog eat when it's stressed because you cannot digest proteins correctly when you are in fight or flight because everything is going to the musculature. And, and once people notice that kind of stuff, they're like, oh my God, I totally noticed that. And it was, it's totally different, right? It's just, everything has changed because, and sometimes I think Dr. Judy, that it's really hard for people to, even think about that they might be causing some of their dog's illness. And it's not, I mean, the biggest thing that I always teach people, it's not intentional. We're yeah. not intentionally doing and knowledge is power. And once we realize that we actually, and some people get very angry at me about this, but I'm, I'm not afraid to say most things <laughs> this, I'm going to say it. You have to take care of yourself first before your dogs. The oxygen. And they're like, how dare you <laughs> actually, it is your dogs are going to be so much better if you start taking care of yourself. And when you do, when you start taking time for yourself, when you start relaxing, when you get off your phones, I, when, I, when people walk their dogs on their phone, <laughs> I want to stop the car and say, pay attention to your dog, you know, yeah. breathe the air, get off the phone. Um, uh, but you know, we're like, out here on a sniffari, get your nose out of your right. phone <laughs> and get your nose on your phone. But like, you know, like taking time for you, even, and you can do that with your dog, right? You can take time for you, but I, it is very important. And, and you couldn't be more right about that exchange between vibration. And that's what definitely comes from the heart. There's a wonderful uh, website called heart math oh, and yeah. you can spend hours on there looking at all the research they have about how our hearts um, sink up to like, I think it's like eight feet when you're standing next to someone, um, they sink up. That's be like, be careful who your friends are. And then 
exactly. um, <laughs> also our animals. Like we sync up with our animals in our homes. So it's very important. But um, let's get back to the gut health. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, just to recap, dominant factors, antibiotics, over vaccination, low stomach acid, is low, it's just so huge, uh, gut, gut stress, imbalanced microbiome, all those things affect the microbiome, right? So we really, when you like get really simple about things, just really simple, health is about assimilation and elimination. And you want to focus on the things that support healthy assimilation, which is all the things we talked about and going to talk about, and healthy elimination. Your dog should be pooping even if they eat. Yeah. They should be they should be pooping twice. Dogs are individuals. There's an occasional dog that poops once, but it's a really big one, right? And that okay, <laughs> great. But like constipation goes overlooked. And so we really want good elimination, good assimilation, and then you have really great health and really great, great organ health. But you can put whatever you want into the tube, but it doesn't mean that it's actually getting into the cells. Right. So that's what we really want to focus on, right? The good things getting into the cells. I will go over my short list okay. that I made for you, Dr. Judy, of the important things that I tell my clients just start off. We don't need to talk about them. They're just, they're just my top seven things to do uh, when you're starting out. Okay. Um, and then we're going to talk about herbs. Okay. One, do not overfeed your dog. Don't do it. We overfeed ourselves a ton. Don't overfeed your dog. It's hard on their liver. It's hard yeah. on their digestion. It messes with good assimilation and good elimination. <laughs> and you're wasting a lot of money because it's going to come out in the. So <laughs> number two, which Judy, uh, Dr. Judy can totally agree with me on. Don't feed cold food. Right. It shuts down your digestion. My human clients, when I find out they're having the frozen smoothie in the morning, it is the worst thing you can do, no matter who you are, for your digestion ever, ever, because it's just like putting a freeze ray on your digestive fire. So don't feed cold food. Make sure it's room temperature or a little bit warmer, okay? Yep. And don't microwave your food. Um, number two, um, you don't overtreat, okay? Okay. Um, you have your dog has this little thing called the migrating uh or sometimes people call it mitigating motor complex in their gut we have it too and it starts about 90 minutes after we eat i'm not sure exactly how much like i think dogs and humans are pretty similar but i don't know like the timing that it starts in dogs i do not know that i should find that out but it basically is a little sweeper so basically think of it as the janitor that comes out and sweeps all the pathogens out of the small intestine okay and as soon as your dog eats, he disappears out of the video game. Just boom, he's gone. And all of those pathogens, if he didn't get to do his job, are stuck there. And that's where you get SIBO. And that's where you get pathogenic overgrowth growth, and it leads to leaky gut. So you want to make sure that you're not treating your dog all the time. Give him a good two and a half to three hours after he eats before you treat. Okay. And that goes for ourselves too. Try that out. See, you'll if you have gut problems, you'll feel so much better if you just stop eating for three hours after you eat your meal. <laughs> um, and then number four, um, consistently, now this is consistently, consistently feeding energetically inappropriate food and supplements can cause your dog to either get more colder or hotter and it can cause disease. And I know that Dr. Judy will agree with me on that one. Um, can't talk about that right now. It's a different conversation. Yes. <laughs> but um, I, Ju uh, Dr. Judy's got a whole bunch of information on that. I've got my energetics course on my uh, website, hopefully someday on Dr. Judy's. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> but that is important. Number five, add digestive enzymes to any kibble or cooked food. Okay. Or if your dog is switched to raw, at least six months to a year, add digestive enzymes. Okay. Uh, Enzymatic health is so important. Um, it's just beyond important. So just, and some people say, oh, well, I've tried them and he made my dog get acid reflux. Try a different form. Try a different kind. There's lots of different formulas out there. And sometimes it only takes one ingredient to mess with things. And I can tell you anecdotally, anecdotally, over the last 20 years of my practice, I can say that very warm dogs do not do well with bromelain. 
um, so if bromelain is in the formula, uh, try one without bromelain and you'll probably do just fine. Um, don't give antibiotics unless your dog's life depends on it. Yeah. I'm going to say it again. Don't give antibiotics unless your dog's life depends on it. Sometimes when your dog gets Lyme, if you find it right away, a round of doxycycline might really help. Okay. And especially if they are complete flat out from a tick bite, that's your dog's life depending on it. Okay. But other than that, if they're going to die, give the antibiotics. If they're not, don't, <laughs> um, find a different way. You can always take them home and you can always use them if you can't turn it around. But right. with all the information that people are providing these days, you should be able to turn it around. Yeah, um, and on, on the, the tick-borne pathogen thing, because I had this conversation with somebody yesterday, when you get that SNAP test in the office, the 40X, the SNAP, whatever we want to call it, and it does anaplasma, ehrlichia, Lyme, and heartworm, uh -huh. if the anaplasma and ehrlichia are positive, the number and percent of false positives on that test are very high. Get a follow-up test called a PCR. Do not just automatically give antibiotics because we are over-medicating dogs, way over-medicating. Most of the time, those tests, what I found in practice, most of the time, those tests are false positives. And even with Lyme, a lot of times that is a false positive. We need to get a better test and also check to see whether your dog is uh, shedding protein in their urine. If they're not shedding any protein in their urine, you may have a false positive on your Lyme as well and may not need that treatment. So, so Reed is talking about dogs who are clinically sick. Messed up, like can't move. They're yeah. completely lame. You know, yeah. I mean, I'm talking like the tick has laid them flat and it has yeah. to be recent. Yes. Doxycycline is not effective for anything that has been given a lot of time. You can look up the science on that. It's there. So um, I hardly ever use um, any type of doxycycline with tick, tick, any type of tick-borne disease. But I'm just saying it would have to be your life, your dog's life depends on it. I mean, and, you know, giving, giving antibiotics for your dog's itchy paws or like a staph infection on their paws is not life-threatening. That's all I'm going to say. Um, and last but not least, number seven, take a humic and fulvic acid supplement to protect your dogs against glyphosate. They have great research right now on um, on the protective function of humic and fulvic acid, uh, protecting the microbiome against the damages of glyphosate, which is absolutely everywhere. It does not matter if your dog eats 100% organic from your backyard because it's in the rainwater. So just everyone should everyone should be taking one. There's other things that protect you, but that's the easiest one to come by. Okay, let's talk... Um, Let's touch on probiotics and then get right to the herbs. Okay. Um, so you asked me about probiotics. Uh, you know, I recommend probiotics, but here's the thing. One, I love variety in a diet um, because you want to feed that microbiome. You want to feed them, you know, they eat off our food and you want to, you want to give a lot of different types of things to get that microbiome flourishing. Number two, um, cycle your your pro probiotics. You know, you don't want the gut to be filled with one specific strain of probiotic. You want to cycle, 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 cycle. Um, um, that's a really good thing. And then, you know, some probiotics give off histamine. Um, so if you have a histamine sensitive dog, you want to, if you give them a probiotic and it seems to worsen their symptoms, that's probably it. Stick to a soil-based probiotic. Um, and uh, again, variety is just so important. Just keep rotating. Don't stay on the same probiotic. Uh, make sure you're given prebiotics. And um, if your dog has a huge reaction to any of them, uh, you most likely have some small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And then you can give probiotics, but they need to be specific ones. And that's another conversation. So I believe in rotate, rotate, rotate in the probiotic department. Okay. Um all right, before we jump on your favorite herbs, I'm going to yeah. answer a question over here, which somebody said, what about antibiotics after surgery? Antibiotics are so overused before, during, and after surgery. If you have a raging peritonitis with a huge infection, uh, 
you may need some antibiotics, but for the routine surgery, spay, neuter, there is no reason to be giving antibiotics. If your veterinarian is performing a clean surgery in a clean environment, antibiotics are not necessary. Even in something like a pyometra, once we get that infected uterus out of there, if there's been no leakage of bacteria into the abdomen during, before, during, or after surgery, you may not even need antibiotics then. It is an individual case thing, but antibiotics like for, for 30 years of practice, I, 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 and I, we were guilty of this at the beginning. They come in, they're getting surgery, they get a shot of penicillin. Well, that lasts 24 hours. What, what the heck is that for? Um, one of my dogs from a feeding tube being in the ICU for 11 days, having a third of her intestines removed, she had a super infection at the feeding tube site. She was sent home with, she was a 12 pound dog with sent home with antibiotics for a 150 pound dog. And I chose not to give them. And I used an herbal preparation topically on the area where the feeding tube infection was at the skin. She did just fine. And we cleared it up and didn't develop even more antibiotic resistance. So it's always an individual case. I'm not saying don't give an antibiotic if it's a life-threatening situation, but routine use of antibiotics in surgery, mm -mm. I, I feel like we should have choir robes on, Dr. <laughs> Judy. I, I, I'm just, I, that was so beautiful. So I had to, I'm sorry I to interrupt you because I had to answer that. Um, but, you know, your veterinarian is going to oh. get really mad when you say, don't give them that antibiotic injection for a spike, her spike. <laughs> yeah, you can always give antibiotics if something goes south. Don't, yeah. preventative antibiotics are not preventing much. No. So, they're just, there are no. they're causing problems. Okay, they're causing back problems. to herbs. Let's talk um, about your top I have herbs. One more, one more thing to say about probiotics because okay. you sparked my memory was one thing. And a lot, I get a lot of complaints about this and I see a lot of complaints. Um, why didn't my animal biome pills work? Why didn't the fecal transplant work? Uh, why, you know, I'm spending all this money on probiotics. My dog's not, my dog's got, I keep getting it tested. It's not, it's not getting better. I can, here's, here's why. Your dog has a little thing called glycocalyx and IgA. Glycocalyx lines the cells and IgA it needs to be in the gut in order to, for commensal bacteria, which are good bacteria, to actually even adhere to the gut wall. Okay, so you can give all the most expensive probiotic you can find, the best ones, the fecal transplants, but you have to prepare the gut for antibiotics if your dog's gut is low on glycocalyx and IgA, and if it's it, if it's you know having a real hard time, the best ways to do that is Saccharomyces boulardii, like even up to six months worth of a treatment if your dog's gut is really depleted, and colostrum. Those are two things. There's other things too, like plantain helps as well, but Saccharomyces and boulardii and colostrum are the two things that I use in my practice to prep the gut when those things aren't happening, like. You know, I've spent all this money on animal biome and nothing, it didn't work. That's because it has to be prepped. Otherwise it's just right out. So I just wanted to answer that and provide just that. Okay, let's talk about herbs. So herbs for the gut, all those things we talked about, all yeast problems, leaky gut, histamine intolerance, SIBO, all these things, right? Um, they in my practice are dealt with, with a handful of herbs because all of these herbs have, they have interlocking cross, they're cross the body systemic uh, reach. Okay. And that includes liver health. And a lot of times lymph health. We, that's another conversation, but the lymphatic system needs to be stimulated. People should be shouting it from the rooftops. So um, I'm going to deal with cooling herbs first. These are okay. for your more, um, warm dogs, dogs that can't regular regulate their body temperature. They never want to be around blankets. I'm simplifying this, but they just don't, you know, they're laying on the cool tile floor. They lay in the sun for 15 minutes and they're done. These are, you know, there's more, probably your dog is a little on the warm side. Okay. Um, aloe, use it in a powder. It's usually in a formula. Okay. Uh, the, um, gut soothe from adored beast. Okay. That's a perfect example of a cooling formula. We've got slip realm, we've got marshmallow, we've got aloe, okay? Those three substances, in my opinion, can heal about any gut. Um, they are so good. Slippery elm uh, is 
I would definitely say more effective than marshmallow at healing like ulcerated pockets in the in which are in humans are called diverticula, um, ulcerated pockets, ulcers in general, different types of uh, Hopefully it'll pop back. Ah. Whoops, we lost you on um, Be Live. Can you pop back into Be Live? Should be back, should be back. <laughs> she's coming back. She's coming back. I'm coming. There she is. Okay. Okay. So I don't know what happened for ulcers. So yeah. <laughs> uh, so, the, but when you when you mix marshmallow, slippery almond, aloe, a, a beautiful music happens. So those are really good, and they're definitely. I would say any dog can use them acutely, but dogs that are more on the warm side are definitely going to be more in tune for long-term use. Um, can you hear me now? Yep, yep. Yep. Okay. And then we have Yarrow. Yarrow isn't talked about a lot, but it is a wonderful balancer and it deals with histamine. It deals with leaky gut, dampness, pain, IBD, IBS. Um, and when you have acid reflux that where the, um, let's just call the little opening um, that keeps stuff in your stomach, uh, when it gets too relaxed, right? The pyloric sphincter, when it gets too relaxed. Um, is that the pyloric sphincter, Dr. D? Uh, no, the- um, Sorry, no, that's the one on the, the, other, uh, the, end. Uh, yeah. the other end. Um, it's the other end. Esophageal sphincter. Yes, yeah, thank you. Esophageal sphincter. Thank you, Cindy. Um, I just call it the little flap. Um, but anyways, when that gets too relaxed, that's when you get the acid reflux when it's not stomach acid related usually. Um, yarrow is perfect for that. Um, so yarrow hits a lot of bases and it's very balancing. It can be cooling and warming, which I love. And then um, it's really SIBO friendly, food sensitivities and the best thing that it does, which is a huge problem with assimilation and elimination, is that it prevents stagnation in the gut. But it's not overstimulating where it's going to give a dog diarrhea. It's actually a very good anti-diarrheal. So um, it's like slippery on where it could deal with constipation and diarrhea. Uh, then we have one of my favorite cooling uh, herbs is plantain. Plantain helps the uh, good bacteria adhere to the gut wall. It is helps with balance the microbiome. It's excellent for leaky gut, food sensitivities, heat in the gut, uh, lots of, it brings down inflammation. And in general, anything that heals, not anything, but most things that heal wounds on the inside are gonna heal wounds on the, um, I mean, on the outside are gonna heal wounds on the inside. And plantain is a wonderful wound healer. Um, Cool. And then last but not least, cleavers. And that is for its function in the lymphatic system. And the gut has these little capillaries and uh, called Peyer's patches. And yep. they suck up fat-soluble vitamins and fat-soluble nutrition and, and fat-soluble toxins. And they flush them into the lymphatic system. And you really want that lymph to be moving. And cleavers... For more warmer dogs is just perfect for long-term use. Love it. And you only need like literally just drops of it for pretty much any size dog. Um, then let's talk about cool dogs. Dogs that love snuggles, that <laughs> love blankies, that love heat in all forms. Um, St. John's wort. You can't give it with pharmaceuticals. So just ignore it if your dog's on pharmaceuticals. But St. John's wort is often overlooked as a gut remedy. It's a beautiful gut remedy. Um, leaky gut, it calms stress. It calms the vagus nerve. It gets you out of fight or flight. Um, it calms reactivity in the gut and definitely deals with food sensitivities. Olive leaf extract. Now, olive leaf can be given with, with warm or cool dogs long-term. I like to give, I mean, I think it's more conducive for dogs that are on the cooler side because it's slightly warming but it's an antifungal. It's a microbiome balancer. It deals with definitely uh, 
food sensitivities. It's antiviral, it's antibacterial. And I will tell you, it's a specific, which this means that it's very, it hones in, a specific for your lechia. I'm just putting that out there, Dr. Judy. Uh, I had your lechia ticks on my property. I had 16 dogs with your lechia and got rid of it with every single one of them with olive leaf. Um, there you go. Yeah. It's so it's very good for olive leaf. It's also, so good if for you Lyme. do have that positive PCR, <laughs> yes. And it's good for Lyme and it's good for anaplasmosis, Bartonella. Um, uh, so it, it's a really good one. Um, and then turmeric, we all know about turmeric. Um, everyone loves turmeric. Turmeric is very warming, not as warming as ginger, but very warming. Um, leaky gut, food sensitivities, yeast, and all of these herbs deal with the liver. Um, turmeric has just far reaching systemic effect. And one of the, its superpowers is that it helps improve phase two detoxification. And in a perfect world, phase one and phase two detoxification are running at the same level. But a lot of times phase one overpowers phase two. And we don't want that because it, it creates a lot of free radicals and a lot of damage. And turmeric can really help regulate phase two detoxification. Um, and that's going to help the entire gut. And it's going to help inflammation. And that's where, you know, inflammation messes with assimilation and elimination. Okay, so turmeric is beautiful for dogs that are cool. And then another herb that's hot is ginger. Dogs who are cool love ginger. People who are cool love ginger. I love ginger. Can't have it. I'm much more warm. I can have little, little bits of it. And then I'm just like, I'm drinking gallons of water, but, um, yeah, I love it too. Ginger, ginger helps with every single gut issue I can think of. Absolutely across the board. And ginger tea is lovely. You can put it over the food. I don't usually use ginger as a powder. I use it as a tea. Um, a fresh ginger root, and you don't just a little ginger root, a little water. You can taste it. Just put it on the dog's food, size appropriate bowl. Um, and it's just lovely. Uh, and it really, you know, anti nausea, helps with diarrhea and constipation, helps with food sensitivities helps calm inflammation. Um, it's just a lovely, lovely, lovely herb. And there's tons of inf good information about ginger out there. And then last but not least, calendula. Calendula is one of the most effective gut herbs on the planet. It stimulates the lymphatics. It's antifungal. It helps with food sensitivities. It's a wonderful wound healer on the outside and it makes an awesome wound healer on the inside. It helps balance the, mac the microbiome because it's a what's called a bacteriostatic. And that doesn't mean that it kills bacteria. It just, it's the police that show up at the frat party and tell them, I'm sorry, <laughs> you've got to go. So everyone has to go to their homes versus having a party. And we know that when people get together, there's much more damage that can be done. <laughs> so that's what calendula is like a little cop that shows up and says, uh-uh. And so it's a bacteriostatic. It makes them disperse. And so, and it's very intelligent. Plants are very intelligent. It goes in and it, it doesn't deal with good bacteria. It only deals with the nasties. So it's sunshine in the body. It's absolutely lovely. Um, See, this is the cool thing about whole foods because the body uses it how it needs to be used. Yes. It, and it, so it doesn't cause problems because the body's just going to, I don't need that, you know, or wow, I really need that. I, I'm, I'm going to suck that up. So yeah. It's, it's yeah. So cool. It's lovely. And, um, and uh, just a couple honorable mentions. Okay. I've got some honorable <laughs> mentions that I think are much more universal and good for pretty much any dog. Milk thistle. Milk thistle isn't oh, just yeah. good for the liver. And when a, a herb is good for the liver, it's good for the gut. So milk thistle is a lovely herb. If your dog has anal gland problems, small amounts of milk thistle will nip that in the bud. It's so good at anal gland problems because it's good at assimilating and eliminating things the way that it should. It regulates. And nettles, nettles are lovely and they're good for the kidneys. They're good for the gut. They're good for the liver. 
they're good for the lymph and they add minerals. So a lot of times, a lot of problems systemically are from low cell salt function, another conversation, and minerals, missing minerals, because our soils are depleted. We're not getting the minerals that we need in our food. And some good sources of minerals are like Himalayan salt, nettles, and horsetail. Horsetail, as much as I love horsetail, it can, it can deplete thiamine out of the body. So we don't, we don't want to use horsetail very minimally and short, for short period of time, a short period of time. So nettles is something that can be used long term and it adds so many minerals to the, to the body. And my mentor and uh, just adore Matthew Wood, uh, I love what he said about nettles. He said, nettles makes things in the body start working again. And that is it, like things that have stopped working, nettles is first go to. And I definitely say if I was stranded on an island and had one herb to pick from, it would be nettles. That would be my choice of herb, nettles. That's and then so last but not least, <laughs> licorice root. Deglycerized licorice root is neutral, which means that it, any dog can take it long term. It's lovely for all gut problems. And it makes other herbs work better. It adds synergy. It's a harmonizer. To most, yes. It's, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Judy. It is a harmonizer. It's a synergist. It's a harmonizer. So we love deglycerized licorice root because it can mess with blood pressure and heart function. So you want to yep. look for deglycerized. And that's what I've got for you, Dr. Judy. That is so amazing. So how many people that are watching, and I know I can't see any raised hands, but how many of you are like, I need a consultation with her like yesterday. <laughs> um, I'm booked for one I, I'm sure you, I was just going to ask you, how many months out are you booked? Four? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. about right. Uh, it's, it's hard to find people with this much knowledge. That's why we need her book. So when it comes out, we will definitely promote the book. We will let you know it's available. And um, is, is this your book that you've written? Is this sort of user-friendly for the pet parent as well as user-friendly for uh, veterinarians who are interested in learning more about herbal medicine? Yes. So um, pet parents can use it. Uh, anyone who doesn't know anything about herbs can use it. And uh, I'm hoping Yay. professionals will use it. And um, it's teaching people how to use herbs holistically. So, you know, you can use the Materia Medica, which is like the herbs that I covered in, in the book. Um, but you can also, and there's also a, an ailment section and things like that. But it also teaches you energetics. It also teaches you how to use herbs holistically. It talks about, you know, standardization versus whole, whole herbs. Um, it's, it's, I really had fun. Now I made a list of like all the things that need to go in the second edition, but um, yeah, I couldn't put everything in. I mean, I, I think I'm at 500 pages. So they, they capped me at, oh at my gosh. a little over 500 pages. So, but no, it's a lovely book. Um, but what I can't- Well, um, the thing is when you're really passionate about something, you get going. And the next thing you know, you're 500 pages in and you go, I haven't even gotten all the way through. Uh, no. So I get it. <laughs> I totally I, get it. I'm sure you do. Um, I do have a thing on my website called Ask the Herbalist, where you can ask me a question if you want. And I also have um, a subscription community. Um, it's called Dogs or Individuals. It's found on canineherbalism.com. Um, and that's $10 a month. And it's super cheap because like my Ask the Herbalist is, starts at, I think, like $30 a question. So my subscription community where you can ask me any question you want, I'm there throughout the week to answer questions. It's $10 a month. So it's pretty cheap. Um, and that's, that's uh, amazing. That yeah. Great resource. Yeah. Great so, resource. And I have that's, a podcast. Oh, and somebody says you also have a podcast. <laughs> I do. I ran Called Dogs or Individuals. Yeah. I do a little ranting, some teaching, some ranting, questions answered, things like that. Oh, well, yeah. we love rants. So. I love <laughs> My community love loves rant. a good rant. <laughs> awesome. Rita, thank you so much. I, like, I Literally, I'm sitting here taking notes. So, uh, you know, this is, 
I, I, I love it when I have a guest on that I'm just like, like, it's so cool. So cool. You are amazing. Uh, again, if you ever get a chance, if she's speaking, are you speaking in California? Yes, I'm in speaking September? on September, uh, what, 30th and October 1st. 30th? Yeah, September 30th. And I think there's only 30 days in September. 30th and October 1st yeah. in Newport Beach. Um, can you throw the link in there, Dr. Judy? It's thrivingpetexpo.com thrivingpetexpo.com and it's in Longport Beach. Long, long, Newport no, Newport Beach. Beach, Newport Beach, Newport Beach, California. I spoke there last year. I'm not going this year because I've got too many things on my calendar. Uh, but I heard Rita speak there last year and they've got like eight different speakers. Uh, it's going to be amazing. So anybody who's on the West Coast or feels like taking a trip to the West Coast, that's a lovely time of year. Um, and you can meet Rita in person and talk to her about all her stuff. Unfortunately, I don't think her book's going to be available by then. I know. But when it is, we'll let you know. And, and my talk uh, is she's got courses your mind. and if we can get well, Sorry. then I'm going to have to, I had to tell you, I hope, hopefully she mind. will, hopefully she will, um, do the, you can buy the, the, the online version after the, after it's over again. So I'm hoping she will, um, either, either that or I'll just beg anyway. <laughs> I'll give you my, thank copy. you very much, Rita. I, there you go. Thanks. Um, so enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you so much for being a guest, for being so powerful and providing that. That was a, a wealth of information. So Rita has courses. Hopefully we're going to get her courses also on Dr. Judy U. So you have plenty of places to find them. Um, and just everybody go out and learn because there's just, yes. there's so much well, we can learn. do without resorting to drugs. I like that. No drugs, no drugs. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Judy, thank you so much for everything that you do. And you are just so <laughs> awesome. Um, I know that you, I know you told me that you've been following me for a long time and I appreciate, uh, I appreciate your support <laughs> and I hope that we can speak together sometime soon. As in like, absolutely. Absolutely. Are, are you, are you, are you going to the HBMA? No, I'm going to be in Hawaii. Um, I am going next year. I'm going oh, next dang. year. Dang. <laughs> okay. I'm speaking this year, so I'll be there, but up, who knows? We'll probably meet up there next year. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Everyone have a wonderful afternoon. Go enjoy your pets. Thank you.